Good morning, and we thank you for joining us on this Lord's Day as we open up the Word of God here at Unity Baptist Church in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we have been studying for the last uh, several weeks in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel's a fascinating character in the scriptures. We often don't hear a whole lot about him, but uh, he sets a wonderful example uh, to us of of how to, as I've entitled this series, walk the tightrope of life in this world as a believer in Christ. Today we're going to end this series in chapter 12, and I want to draw your attention, if you have your Bibles, to the very last uh, verse of uh, chapter 12. Verse number 13, it says, But as for you, go on your way to the end, you will rest, and then you will stand to receive your allotted inherit, inheritance at the end of the days. <clears throat> uh, this is the last we hear from Daniel in the Bible, but I want to talk to you today about a passionate pursuit, about the idea of, of Daniel's life, that he was in pursuit constantly throughout the book of Daniel uh, of a, a spiritual pursuit, and we're going to talk about that today. You know, the book of Daniel is really a, a very uh, interesting mix of end-time prophecy, and kind of mixed into all of that is a sort of mini-biography of the life of Daniel, some highlights from his life that really give us insight into him as an individual, uh, but also give us some real application for our own life today. All of the uh, major prophets follow a, a similar format. They have uh, prophecies, of course, but there's also intermingled in with them a sort of personal biography. And even some of the minor prophets uh, follow this, but none of them, in my opinion at least, are as interesting as is the book of Daniel. Uh, most of the biographical portions of this book take place in the first six chapters. From chapter 7 to the end of the book, uh, the final six chapters are primarily prophetic in, uh, in the book of Daniel. In chapter 7, Daniel has a dream about four beasts that arise up out of the sea. And, and when the Bible talks, at least in a prophetic sense, about the sea, it's talking about the the Gentile nations. These, these uh, beasts rise up from the Gentile nations. Uh, it is a, a vision that is known in Scripture, or, or uh, a term that is known in the Scripture as the times of the Gentiles. And, and it speaks of the time when Gentiles uh, rule the earth, uh, including Israel, uh, Christ spoke of this in the book of Luke, chapter 21 and verse number 24. He talked about Jerusalem being trodden uh, underfoot of the Gentiles uh, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And uh, this period of time began with Nebuchadnezzar's final conquest of Jerusalem, the final conquest in 588 B.C. And it will last through... Uh, uh, the return of Christ until Christ comes back to establish his own eternal kingdom in the future. So that would tell us that at this present time, you and I are living in the times of the Gentiles, and we will be living uh, in those times uh, for the rest of our lives uh, until we return with Christ at the end of the tribulation period. That's when this period of time uh, will end and the Gentiles will no longer uh, have rule in the earth. The dream in Daniel chapter 7 is comparable to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, but, but there's different imagery that is used by Daniel in that. But both of them convey the truth that during the times of the Gentiles, there will be four great Gentile kingdoms that will dominate the earth. And each of those kingdoms would bear rule over God's people, Israel. That's why they're significant 
in the word of God because these nations bear rule over Israel. The first one that is mentioned is a lion with eagle's wings. Uh, it is Babylon, the great kingdom of Babylon. Uh, it is the head of gold in chapter two. The second beast that comes out of the sea is a bear that is raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth. And it signifies the Medo-Persian empire. Uh, in chapter two, it was the chest of the image and the arms of silver. The third beast that rises up out of the sea of Gentile nations is uh, described as a leopard. It has four heads and four wings. And this is the empire of Greece that conquered the, the Middle East very, very quickly. Uh, like a leopard would fly through uh, a country. In the imagery of chapter two, it is the images stomach and arms of bronze. Uh, there are a thighs, I'm sorry, of, of bronze. And then the final beast is, is described in Daniel chapter seven as a frightful beast with iron teeth and iron claws. And it comes up out of the sea and it pounds upon uh, the ground of the sea. It has 10 horns. And this is the Roman empire. It has legs of iron with feet of mixed clay in Daniel's image of chapter two. Both of these visions conclude with the coming of Christ and the establishing of his earthly kingdom, which will last forever. The vision of chapter eight, I'm just gonna take you through these very quickly before I get to the point that I wanna to make today, but the vision of chapter eight in Daniel concerns the fall of Medo-Persia. And in this, in this vision, uh, Medo-Persia is represented by a ram with two horns. One horn is longer than the other, just as Persia was dominant over uh, Media. Uh, one was longer, one horn longer than the other. It, it pushed to the west, to the north, and to the south, which was the pattern of Persia's conquest in the ancient world. Daniel also saw in that vision uh, a he-goat that had a prominent horn between its eyes. This is Greece, and it is Alexander the Great. And when he came to full power, this goat, the prominent horn was broken. And that signifies the death of Alexander the Great, who died very young. And then when, when the horn was broken, then four other horns grew up in its place. And we know from history that Alexander's kingdom was divided between four of his generals. And then in, in, in the process here of these horns growing, another, what the Bible calls a little horn, grew out of the four other horns and this little horn dominated the beautiful land or the land of Israel. And it tells us in, in Daniel chapter eight that this little horn would cause the sacrifices to cease and that he would violate the sanctuary. This little horn represents Antiochus Epiphanes and, and his overthrow is what is celebrated at Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. Daniel goes on in chapter nine, a very interesting chapter. And we read about the prophecy of the 70 weeks. If you have been in church or you've heard about this, you've heard about the 70 weeks of Daniel. Well, this is the great prophecy of the 70 weeks, which will be divided into three periods of prophetic weeks, and I don't want to get into a lot of detail because it's, it's, it's hard to follow, but uh, a prophetic week is uh, seven years, and it's seven 
years, each day of the week represents a year. And this that Daniel's talking about in the 70 weeks is divided up into three different categories. There's a category of seven weeks of 49 years. Then there is a category of 62 weeks, constituting 434 years. And that is the, the timeline to the presentation of, of Messiah at the triumphal entry. And here's, here's the, the thing, that this is very important. And those in the first century who lived during the time of Christ, had they known this prophecy or understood this prophecy, they would have known when he was coming. Some of them apparently did. The final week will be the week of tribulation. It's a, a seven year period divided into two half and into two parts. There's a three and a half years of relative peace, and then there's a three and a half years of great tribulation. And all of this is explained in Daniel chapter nine. The rest of, of this, of uh, chapters 10 through 12, talks about the humiliation of Israel and then their restoration. And here's an important thing. God is not done with Israel. <clears throat> you know, Israel <clears throat> takes a lot of heat. <clears throat> uh, even in the modern world, it takes a lot of heat. But God's not done with Israel. Israel is going to suffer great humiliation during the tribulation period. But Israel is also going to be restored and, and ruled over by their Messiah. Our understanding of the chrono chronology of the end times owes so much to Daniel's prophecies. He even made uh, important prophecies about the intertestament period, the 400 silent years is what they're known as. And he talked about the exact day that Messiah would be presented to Israel as their king. And that exact day is March the 30th, AD 33, when Jesus came down from the Mount of Olives and into the city of Jerusalem. By our calendar, it would have been March the 30th, 33 AD, the exact day he pinpointed, the exact day Christ would be presented. Daniel is really an amazing book, but the emphasis that we've made during this series of messages is upon the man Daniel personally. That was intentional. That's how I wanted to present this. Uh, and that's how I'd like to close the study today. The thing that strikes me here about Daniel, as he enters the ninth decade of his life, possibly close to the 10th decade of his life, is his continuing interest and his continuing passionate pursuit for the future plans and purposes of God. I'm not sure, I've been in church for a long time and, and I'm not sure that we often think of Daniel in exemplary terms. Uh, we do for David, we do for Moses, we do for, for Ruth and other Bible characters. We look at them in exemplary terms. They are an example to us of something. You know, we, we learn what they teach us about living a godly life. But I don't remember, in all of my years in church, I don't remember very much of, of hearing about Daniel in those terms, except for Daniel 1 8, where he purposed in his heart. That's the only thing I remember ever being spoken of about Daniel in an exemplary way. But I think the book of Daniel is full of, of examples from Daniel as, as to how you maintain your balance in in a culture that is fading away, in a culture that is giving itself over to wickedness. How do you stand in that culture righteously 
and serve in that culture, and I mean in depth in that, that culture, how do you do that and maintain your spiritual integrity? Daniel is a man who shows us how that is done. I usually think of Daniel in terms of his prophecies. That is the way I have always thought of, of Daniel. I, I think of him in, in terms of what his prophecies mean and how they're going to affect my life and, and how they set in order uh, the events leading to the coming of Jesus Christ. But Daniel provides us with, with some tremendous examples of a godly life in a pagan atmosphere. How do you live your life that way? How do you maintain your balance? How do you walk that tightrope that we've talked about in the last several weeks? How do you conduct yourself as a believer in a hostile environment? How do you trust the Lord in an impossible circumstance? Well, we, we can read about Daniel and what he did and how he did it, and we can learn some things from that. Our experience isn't going to be the same as his. I, I'm never going to be tossed into a lion's den, and, and neither are you. I, I doubt seriously that I'm going to be taken into captivity uh, as Daniel was. But, but even so, even if that did happen, how can I live my life in a way that honors the Lord, whatever happens to me in my life? That's what I want to talk about today. So in closing... As we close out these thoughts about Daniel, I want to focus on things that I've observed from his life over these weeks that I believe will help us try to walk this tightrope of the world system in which we live today. Uh, there are three things I want to point out. First of all is in Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 8. This is a verse that probably more than any other verse in the book of Daniel is famous. Uh, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat or, or, or with his wine or the food that came from his table. So I want to talk to you about Daniel's passionate pursuit. You know, following Christ is not merely about our sitting in church on Sunday and following directions. You know, you go to church, you sit down, pastor, music leader, whoever it is, gets up and they tell you to stand up, so everybody stands up. They tell you when you need to sit down, so you sit down. They tell you what you need to sing, so you sing that. They tell you we're going to prayer, so you bow your head. It's, you know, and a lot of people have the idea that that's what it means to follow Christ. But it's not. It, it's not. <clears throat> following Christ is not just a nice idea that we get the warm fuzzies about. <clears throat> following Christ, if you look at the life of Daniel or <clears throat> any other Bible character, following Christ is a serious business. And it it requires planning and it requires sacrifice and and determination and discipline and spiritual passion and and a uh, a desire above everything else to please the Lord in our speaking and in our thinking and in our doing. For a person to follow the Lord is so contrary to our natural instincts that it means <clears throat> we have to, at the very beginning, at the outset, we have to do some real soul searching. We have to work our way beyond the emotion of, of religious activities. We have to uh, uh, resist the outside pressure that tells us we ought not to do that. We ought not to follow that path. You got to live your life with with gusto. You got to enjoy it. You got to do this, that, and the other thing. And you have to resist that outside pressure and, and ultimately get down, as we talked about in the first uh, message, we've got to get down to the bedrock of our soul. 
the very depths of our being, who we really are. We've got to get down there and do some business with God at the heart level in terms of our attitudes and our actions, our affections, how we think. All of those things have to be brought to bear if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And we have to ask ourselves some questions. What is it that I really want from this relationship with the Lord? Is all I'm looking for is a, a guarantee of heaven? Is that, is that it? Is, is what I am really looking for that, that, my, uh, that my troubles will go away or that my circumstances will change? What is it that I really want out of this relationship? But a more important question than that is, is what does the Lord want out of this relationship? What does he want? Is he truly satisfied with my just showing up? <clears throat> is that it? Is that all he wants from me? He just wants me to come in and sit down and follow, follow the directions, give some money. Is that what he's after? Or is there something deeper that he seeks from my life than just a nice reputation among my friends and among my associates? What does God want out of this relationship that he has established with me through my salvation? What is he after from me? Somebody says, well, I, I didn't know he wanted anything from me. Well, of course he does. There, there is great, I, I hate to put it in these terms, but, but he has made a great investment in you through the death of his son, through the payment that Christ made upon the cross and you receiving Christ in repentance and faith, asking him into your life. We don't, Ask him into our life just as, as a sort of pass into heaven. God has something right now for us that he wants. And, and we're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. Daniel challenges me, and I hope he does you. He challenges me to think beyond the immediate circumstance I face. He challenges me to think beyond the ongoing challenge that, that I face as I work in that office, as I speak with my friends or, or the superiors who are over me. You know, he wants me to think beyond that. He wants me to see something eternal, even in those relationships that may not be the best. In Daniel, we see a young man whose character was questioned, a young man whose life was threatened, a young man who was plagued by petty jealousies from fellow workers. He was lied about, he was spied on, and we could go down the list. And he's not the only Bible character who faced those kinds of things. Joseph did too. And, I, and, and no doubt others did as well. I believe that he was able to take those things in his life. He was able to take it. And he was able to remain in balance in his life because he was a man in passionate pursuit of something better, something higher, and something of eternal worth. You know, all these things down here that all of us have to deal with, and they're irritating, I understand, and people are irritating, I understand that. But so did Daniel. And, and beyond just their being irritated, irritating, they were hostile. They were pagan. Uh, they worshiped a different God. They, they spoke a different language. They, 
they had a different religion. They all, you know, all of those things had to be taken into consideration. And yet Daniel made it. And the reason that he made it is he was able by the grace of God to look beyond all of those petty things and look to something that was eternal. Remember Paul's testimony in Philippians chapter three and verse number 12 through 14, where he acknowledges that he hadn't arrived. He acknowledges to the people of Philippi that he was not a perfect man. And he says to them there, not as though I had already attained either while already perfect or, or complete. He says, but I follow after that which also is following after me. I'm in pursuit of something. And I forget the things that are behind and I reach toward the things that are before for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And because of this inward awareness, the Apostle Paul makes that confession that he's not going to be tied to his past, forgetting the things that are behind. But a lot of people get all tangled up in their past. Paul said, I'm not going to do that. I'm forgetting the things that are behind, whether they are good or bad. I'm not going to live back there because I can't do anything about it anyway. I've got to keep reaching forward to that which is before me. And, and he is in pursuit of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God's high calling. That's what Daniel's after. He is after God's high calling in his life. I believe we see the same kind of an attitude in Daniel, a sort of sanctified dissatisfaction with his spiritual journey that created him in him a passionate pursuit to see God's purpose in saving him brought to completion in his life. You know, I think a great danger that we face, all of us face in our Christian life is satisfaction. We come to a point of satisfaction. We, we've gone as far as we want to go. We, we've accomplished everything we want to accomplish. And so we're just kind of satisfied. And so uh, the Bible refers to this as being at ease in Zion. And when we put our spiritual life kind of on a cruise control basis and we, and we decide we're going to just enjoy the ride to heaven, from, from here on out, I'm just going to enjoy the ride to heaven. We'll rest in past involvements. We'll rest in past accomplishments and in past victories. We will enjoy the spiritual comfort food of remembering what used to be and wait to go to heaven. Listen, that's not how Daniel lived his life. And that's what I hope we'll learn from him. From a young age, he dealt with the issues of heart. He dealt with who he really was and what he truly wanted his life to be. He dealt with that and he meant it. And in that moment, he made a crucial decision. And that is that whatever it was he wished to be, he must begin becoming. Whatever it was that he saw out there that he, he thought was God's high calling in his life, whatever that was, he decided that that moment he had to start becoming that. He had to work toward that. This became his passionate pursuit. And we see it in several ways. Let me go through these real quickly. First of all, he made a commitment to obey God's word in chapter one and verse number eight. You say, well, that was just about food. No, it was much more than just about food. It was about obeying the word of God. You know, there are no shortcuts to Christ likeness. There are no detours from obedience to God's word for the, for the believer. 
my mandate and your mandate is to obey his word. And only as I submit myself to the commands of the word am I going to grow in faith and see God's objective in saving me fulfilled in my life. He didn't save me to go to heaven, although that was secured in my salvation. He saved me to bring glory to himself through my life. And that's the same reason he saved you. Secondly, Daniel made a commitment to godly companionship. We talked about this a few weeks ago in chapter 1, verses 11 through 21. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Daniel was wise enough to know that if he wanted to pursue his spiritual passion, he couldn't hang around people who had no such intent. He couldn't hang around bad company, and neither can you and I. We have to be careful about the friends we have. We have to be careful to take note of who we hang out with because they reflect what we are becoming. Third thing he did was that his focus was on eternal values in chapter 5, verses 17 through 24. We talked about all of these things, but I want to review them with us. In the face of earthly reward and earthly praise from a powerful king, Daniel focused on what mattered most. And in speaking to King Belshazzar in chapter 5, he talked about humbling himself before the Lord and bringing glory and honor to the name of the Lord. That's what really mattered. And it's what really matters in your life and in my life. Because that's God's purpose for everyone. But particularly for the believer. And it's so easy for us to get distracted by the bells and whistles of, of this world's uh, stuff. So Daniel stood before King Belshazzar. He had, a, he had a problem with the writing on the wall, as any of us, I'm sure, would if that happened to us. But he thought that, that all Daniel wanted was a gold chain, a, a royal robe, and a position. And Daniel wanted none of those things because that's not where his mind was. That's not what he was looking at. His, his values were, were far beyond that. And so he told King Belshazzar, you know, keep all your stuff. I don't need it. I don't need your stuff because my purpose, my aim, is to bring glory to the God that I serve. Don't get distracted. <clears throat> by the temporal and, and passing things of this world because they will keep us from our focus upon the purpose God gave us for life in the first place. And then finally, uh, he was committed to trusting the Lord in impossible situations. Chapter 6 and verse number 23, we talked about this last time, and Daniel in the lion's den, probably, uh, I would guess, the most famous story in the book of Daniel. You know, the trials of life test our faith. <clears throat> the trials of life, and we all have them, they test our faith. Daniel had plenty of them. You probably have had plenty of them, too. But Daniel was not a one-trick pony. His response to these trials, how he was going to respond to them in faith and in his trust to the Lord, his response was whatever the trial required. Sometimes it was diplomacy. Sometimes it was an appeal to the authority. Sometimes it was boldness to the authority. Sometimes it was simply trust, but at the foundation of it all was his faith in God. And we, we read about that in uh, Daniel chapter 6, you know, that, that Daniel trusted his God. That's why he was delivered from the lion's den. 
So all of us face these situations in our life. Maybe you're facing a situation like this now and you look at it and it just seems absolutely impossible for you to get through it. And yet the question is whether you will trust your own schemes or you're going to trust God who formed you for his purpose to deliver you from that. Daniel's passionate pursuit was to live out his faith in a culture whose values were in complete opposition to the faith that he had. And his life is a model for us in walking that tightrope in our own life. Then I want us to, to consider Daniel's pattern of consistency. In chapter six and verse number five, it, it says, uh, then these men said, we will never find any charge against this Daniel unless we find something against him concerning the law of his God. Another thing that I notice about Daniel's life is a pattern of consistency. And that was evident in both public and private life for Daniel. Whether he was in the presence of the king or whether he was with his friends, whether he was at home or in the palace, he was the same person wherever you found him. There are few things that diminish the gospel more in the eyes of the unsaved than an inconsistent life. Daniel was a devout worshiper of Jehovah God who worked under the authority of a devout worshiper of the god Marduk. And we wonder to ourselves how that could possibly worked out, and yet it did. I really believe that Daniel and the other Jewish captives like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Ezekiel, and so on, lived lives of such consistency and power before Nebuchadnezzar that he could not overlook their devotion. They lived out their faith while working for the good of his kingdom, and they did. I really believe that Daniel and the other captives were so effective in their presentation of the Lord in Babylon because the Babylonians understood that these men who worshiped a different God were nonetheless for them. They were for them. They, they wanted the best for this kingdom. Daniel's rebellion was not an act of rebellion against Babylon. It was not an in-your-face rejection of the Babylonian gods. Daniel sincerely loved and sincerely worshiped Yahweh, and he showed it in all aspects of his life. He showed it to the extent that it almost cost him his life. You know, I've found that even most unsaved people will respect that kind of devotion and consistency. We're never going to win the world or win our friends by hating them. We're never going to uh, win over those who are over us in authority by plotting against them behind their back. Daniel consistency, consistently showed God's love and concern for the people that he, he worked with and that he worked for. And in so doing, he won the right <clears throat> to speak to them about the one he was passionate about. What a great example to us. <clears throat> in showing the love of Christ for the people we live with, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, or the people that we work for. We each need to build a platform of consistency, consistency of life, from which we can declare the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what Daniel did. One last thing and I'll be done. And that's in verse number 13 of chapter 12, and we read that a few minutes ago. But that is Daniel's promised end. Yeah, I love the way the book of Daniel ends. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Daniel is uh, over 100 years old now, according to Jewish tradition, and in his final quote, we find him asking questions and desiring answers. And what that says to me is that he's still pursuing answers to God's plan and purposes in the world. He's about to die. He's about to check out of this life. But he's still got questions. He still wants answers. What a way to live your life. You're still looking forward, still grasping for the answers to the issues of eternal consequence. As you cross the finish line of life, as you leave this life, this is how we all should desire to come to the end of our life. With the quiet confidence that comes from a life well lived, first of all. And with faith in the God we serve to work all things after the counsel of his own will. On the one hand, living your life as it should be lived. On the other hand, still pursuing the plan and purposes of God in your life. You know, I don't want to come to the end of my life. I, I'm sure you don't. I don't want to come to the end of my life as some grumpy old man uh, bemoaning the way things are and, and wishing for what probably never was. I want to come to it with confidence and with hope in the Lord. And to do that, I must live my life in the same kind of way that Daniel did. You live in the present, you deal with things in the present, but you live to honor and glorify the Lord. But you also have an eye on the future. Hebrews tells us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. So you, we've got a dual responsibility. And one of these days, our life is going to come to an end. Daniel is about to be dismissed from life. And I, and I want you to note there, the Lord is speaking to Daniel and he says, but as for you, Daniel's asking him all these questions. And the Lord says to Daniel, but as for you, go on your way to the end. You will rest and then you will stand to receive your allotted inheritance at the end of days. Is, go on your way, Daniel. You're not going to find the answer to these questions. I'm not ready to give them to you. So just go on your way. But I want to let you know that you will come to rest. He was going to die but you will stand once again to receive your allotted inheritance at the end of days. You're gonna be raised from the grave in the end of days. But for now, just kind of go on your way. <laughs> That's our great hope. We're never gonna know all of the answers, have all of the answers any more than Daniel did. And one of these days, God is going to say to you and to me, just go on your way. You've been told as much as you're going to be told. And you're going to rest. But here's the hope. You'll rise again in the last day. I hope today that that is your hope, as it was Daniel's hope. Never stop learning. Never stop pursuing. Never stop being passionate about the work of God and the purpose of God in your life and come to the end of your days as Daniel did with confidence and with hope because both of those are found in Christ. Father, I pray that you will bless this message and that you will use it to convict us, that you will use it to uh, draw us into a closer relationship with you May this be a blessed day for all who have listened today. And may we seek above everything else to live our lives as Daniel did, to the honor and glory of Christ. And with the hope that we will stand in the last day with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.